Welcome back. Our next session is a panel discussion on case presentation. Uh, a difficult diagnosis will be discussed. Dr. Srinivas will be presenting the case and the discussions will be Dr. Roshni Vara and Dr. Vidyut Bhatia. Dr. Roshni Vara is currently placed in UK, Evelina Children's Hospital and Lon in London. She is trained in inherited metabolic diseases at Evelina Children's and Great Ormond Street. She has a CCT in pediatric hepatology. She has a subspecialty interest in metabolic liver disease and liver transplantation. Dr. Vidyut Bhatia is a senior consultant based at Delhi Max Super Speciality Hospital. He was a founding member of Celiac Support Organization. He has a special interest in metabolic liver disease, celiac disease, and NAFLs. He has numerous publications. Importantly, he was a co-author of a textbook of pediatric gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition. Dr. Srinivas is a consultant pediatric gastroenterologist based at Chennai Kanji Kamakodi Child Test Hospital. He is also visits Apollo Children's. He has authored several textbook chapters and he was a treasurer in the recent past. And he has his interest in childhood liver diseases, inflammatory bowel disease and food allergy. And he has also has good publications. And I believe uh, I would, Dr. Srinivas, please take over uh, the uh, case discussion and over to you. Thank you very much, all faculty. Thank you. I welcome my esteemed faculty for this session on metabolic liver diseases, a difficult diagnosis. Without wasting any time, I'll go on to the first case. So this is a first born child to non-consanguineous parents. The main issues the child presented to us were cholestatic jaundice and an incidentally noticed bilateral medullary nephrocalcinosis picked up on an ultrasonogram abdomen. The birth weight of the child was 2.05 kg and the child now weighed only 2.7 kg. This child also had roving eye movements and a vertical nystagmus, a mild jaundice, but a very firm hepatosplenomegaly and pigmented stools. And I played a short video for you to see those roving nystagmus. Dr. Vidyut, what are yeah. your thoughts at this point of time on this child? So, um, can we go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Okay. So basically the child is presented with uh, uh, cholestatic jaundice and with some uh, uh, failure to thrive along with, uh, I would say, CNS involvement. Okay. And, and the hepatosplenomegaly. Right. Okay. So obviously, the first uh, thing that uh, comes to mind of anybody with a, a newborn baby with jaundice, or let's say an infant with jaundice, would be uh, biliary atresia. But in this case, you have got uh, uh, pigmented stools with the uh, failure to thrive and CNS involvement. I would not like to keep that uh, on the top of my list. But definitely, I would like to keep some form of a neurometabolic disease, which also involves the liver. So, Any other uh, thoughts on what it could be? Neurology as well as liver? Yeah, so there are so many other conditions, uh, you know, uh, which would, uh, uh, which, we, which we would say would involve like, uh, you could have uh, uh, infections also. Okay, would so as a pediatrician, my first thought would be whether it was an intrauterine infection. Yeah, intrauterine infections like CMV and other toxoplasma. Sure. And all. Okay, yeah. so we, this is the LFT that was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I think I want to highlight here is probably this kid has got a slightly low albumin, a slightly mm -hmm. high INR right. with elevated liver enzymes. So we worked up for a possible intrauterine infection. Mm -hmm. The CMV IgM was positive, but the fundus did not show any chorioretinitis and the MRI brain was normal, but we had a very high alkaline uh, alpha fetal protein. So do you yeah. think that this is CMV causing the problem? Uh, see, uh, 
CMB often is a red herring, you know, in most of our uh, neonatal uh, jaundice patients. So definitely it would be on the back of the mind, but uh, just looking at this picture, I would not say it is a classical case of a CMB uh, hepatitis because you've got so many other things like medullary calcinosis and plus your ultrasound cranium and MRI is normal. Uh, you would have some changes if it was, you know, uh, as, uh, CMV which was involved in the brain. So I would still, uh, you know, keep uh, infection lower down and maybe some form of a metabolic uh, disease up in the order. Sure. So we proceeded to work up for a metabolic liver uh, disease with failure to thrive, like tyrosinemia, cystic fibrosis, and an IEM workup, a baseline screening, which came back as negative. Dr. Roshni, any thoughts, any other thing that we need to do for this child? Um, I think my question would be what was involved in the IEM workup. So for me, I would want to know a plasma lactate, um, which can be difficult to interpret in small babies. Um, and then a plasma amino acid. So sometimes the alanine can be elevated as a reflection of um, lactic acidosis, um, along with urine, organic acids, which may show a lactic aciduria, um, so it might confirm the lactate. And I think it was yeah, pertinent to exclude tyrosinemia with the urinary succinylacetone. So yeah, I'd sure. want to know what was in the IEM workup. So why are you asking specifically for a plasma lactate? What do you have in mind? Ah, <laughs> Um, so I think the um, rotatory nystagmus is quite telling for me um, for mitochondrial disease. So as a very soft marker for mitochondrial disease, we would you know, potentially measure a lactate and look for an elevated lactate. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we did go ahead to do a liver biopsy for this child. And Dr. Vidyut, what we hit upon was a child with the liver which shows microvesicular steatosis. Can you uh, tell so, us now? Yeah, so this thoughts? is basically, you know, you can look at the hepatocytes. They are showing a lot of whitish uh, vesicles. And of course, this is, uh, if you have a single vesicle, it, it, would, uh, it would be classified as a macrovesicular. But here you can make out that there are a lot of uh, small uh, vesicles. Yeah, okay. So uh, whenever you find such a picture in the liver biopsy, always... It usually points out to a drug as a cause of uh, steatosis. But uh, in this child, because he's just two months old, and maybe you should also, we should have asked for a history whether any toxic drugs were given or not. And of course, like uh, Dr. Roshni <laughs> pointed out, some metabolic diseases like uh, metachondrial disorders and fatty acid oxidation defects also cause. Uh, microvesicular steatosis. So that would be in the differential. Okay. So uh, thank you for that input. So we did go ahead with a genetic workup for this child, which actually showed a deletion in the DGU OK gene, confirming our suspicion of uh, mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome type 3. Well done, both panelists. So my question to you, Dr. Roshni. So how do we treat this child? Can we transplant this child? Mm. Um, yeah, it's always a controversial question. So I, th I think one thing to point out was the coagulopathy often for us um, when children with DGOK presents um, contraindicates a liver biopsy, but in your case, it was not um, severe. So a biopsy was possible. So that was helpful in that situation. Um, I would not transplant this child. I think if you are um, equipped enough to have the genetic diagnosis back before um, the child uh, you know, heads towards transplant, then I think it's important not to transplant these children. So all of the DGOK patients we've seen over the past 20 years have passed away within the first year of life um, with neurological deterioration. So this is a this is a hepatocerebral form with severe mitochondrial DNA depletion. So I think transplantation is contraindicated. Despite it, there are a few case reports in the literature, um, okay. but particularly okay. in this child with the nystagmus and the quite obvious neurological involvement, I would not 
and Thank treat you so much. Support. Thank you so much. We'll move on to case three, and I just want to summarize that the failure to thrive, the involvement of more than one organ system, neurological as well as liver, and an elevated plasma lactate should be the important features for us to suspect the possibility of a mitochondrial liver disease. The liver biopsy often shows microvesicular steatosis and genetics might help. And if it is DGU okay, then maybe transplant is not a good option. For other, maybe mitochondrial liver disorders, transplant might help. Thank you. We go on to case two. So Dr. Vidyut, this is a six-year-old boy who was brought uh, for evaluation of a big liver. Right. And these are his LFTs. What are your thoughts? So if I interpret this LFT uh, in the light of a child with a big liver, uh, I would say uh, since the, the bilirubin is not elevated, much of a cholestasis is going on. Uh, there is some amount of inflammation in the liver, uh, uh, like ranging from 500 to 1200. Uh, but the rest of the uh, LFTs appear to be okay because albumin is uh, more or less preserved and your uh, INR is also good. So I would say it is a whatever it is, it is a compensated liver uh, along with. Uh, uh, some inflammation or hepatitis. And since there is a very huge liver, I would say uh, we should look at uh, some form of a uh, storage disorder. Sure. Uh, along with, uh, I don't know what the status of the spleen is. If spleen is not in, uh, enlarged, then again it goes in favor of a, a, a metabolic uh, storage disease. But then sure. uh, one should also, you know, keep in mind all the routine causes of a liver disease like your Wilson's or your autoimmune and uh, viral hepatitis also in, Thank you. in mind. So yes, we did consider Wilson's autoimmune and the possibility of glycogen storage disorder. The Wilson's workup and the autoimmune workup came back as negative. The ultrasonogram shows basically a fatty liver. The echo was normal. And we did come up with fasting hypoglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, as well as elevated CPK. Dr. Roshni, what are your thoughts at this stage? So I think storage disorder is um, yeah, pertinent to consider. So I think my first thought um, with the elevated CK would be a glycogen storage disorder, so a muscle, liver, phenotype or subtype. Um, and then the other thing to exclude would be a cholesterol ester storage disorder. I don't know what the cholesterol was, but um, yeah, a, a GSD or a lysosomal storage disorder. Oh, so does a cholesterol ester storage disorder also present sometimes with the elevated CK? Uh, no, not okay. often, no, not that I've seen, but with the elevated triglycerides, we'll just bear that in mind. But sure, yeah, that's sure, um, sure. significantly Absolutely. elevated Absolutely. CK. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, yes, so we went ahead with a liver biopsy. And this shows actually nodule formation, fibrocollagenous septae, and the classical clear hepatocytes with the pale eosinophilic cytoplasm with a centrally placed nucleus. And the PAS and diastase stains clearly show that there was abundant glycogen which got washed away once we put the diastase confirming a diagnosis of glycogen storage disorder. This point of time, what I want to ask Dr. Vidyut is that, are you concerned about the amount of nodules or the fibrocollagenous septae in this child? Yeah, uh, see, um, it's ob obviously uh, if there are presence of fibrous tissue and uh, fibrocollagenous septae and nodule formation in the liver, uh, it is of concern to us because ultimately all this will lead to portal hypertension, you know, and uh, and and if we just uh, look at it as a simple GSD, uh, many pediatricians would feel that there is no need for doing an endoscopy or, you know, not further, uh, uh, you know, going into uh, looking at the biopsies and all, uh, because we come do come across uh, patients who have just had a workup for GSD and that's it. No biopsies, no endoscopies. So these are things which I would like to do in this time. Uh, 
you've already done a, 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 a biopsy and I would again go ahead and do an endoscopy to see whether this fibrosis is actually leading to any pericial formation or portal hypertension or not. Sure. What types of glycogen storage disorder are likely to lead to a lot of fibrosis as well as portal hypertension? So mainly, I think it's the most common one which leads to uh, fibrosis and portal hypertension. But uh, type 4 is also known to cause this. And okay. rarely, uh, 9, I think one variety of 9. I see. That's right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Just, just to note, though, in in type four, you wouldn't, you don't tend not to see glycogenated hepatocytes like that. You would see um, a myelopectin or polyglucosan within the hepatocytes. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, we did confirm a genetic diagnosis in this child of possible glycogen storage disorder type three. And my question to you, Dr. Roshni, is that. As pediatricians, we are very comfortable treating glycogen storage disorder with uh, raw, uncooked corn starch. But how does the treatment of type 3 differ from the treatment of type 1? So type 3 is slightly um, different in that it causes a, a ketosis. So they, the children tend to have a ketotic hyperglycemia. So one of the aims is not only to maintain euglycemia but also to normalize ketones so we think that the hyperketosis often causes the short stature and, and once you ameliorate the ketosis they start to grow in in height so their growth velocity increases um, and then type 3 there's many um, publications um, more recently about using a high protein slightly lower carbohydrate diet because protein is gluconeogenic so they can use protein as a as a source of uh, glucose as opposed to delivering lots and lots of carbohydrate which then gets stored in the liver and isn't used effectively so you would use both but a higher protein diet is um, known to be more effective for the myopathy and cardiomyopathy in type 3. Oh so so by using protein as much as about three to four gram per kg? Four gram, yeah. Through the muscle? Yeah. yeah. Oh yes. okay. Okay. It has been shown, yeah. Thank you, thank you. We move on to the next case, which is a one and a half year old boy. This is again a child who was born through IV conception to non-consanguinous parents. He was born with a good birth weight and his presenting issues at the time of admission was only an intercurrent infection of fever and loose stools. His immediate concerns were that of only fever and loose Stand concerns. The mom always described this child as a child who keep on vomiting and we wondered whether it was an element of forced feeding. But he didn't improve with treatment for possible reflux. He was not growing well, so it wasn't necessarily forced feeding. And there was a progressive abdominal distension. So we did find that he was not doing well on his growth charts. So Significant failure to thrive with the weight height as well as the head circumference falling below the third percentile. And what was striking on clinical examination was a very firm liver. So he was already worked up under the pediatric unit where they had treated for possible Burkhold area sepsis and they suspected immune deficiency, cystic fibrosis, which all came back as negative. And then decided to look at the possibility of a liver disease. So these are his uh, liver function tests and the workup for a possible glycogen storage disorder. Uh, Dr. Vidyut, my doubts here. This is a child who's had failure to thrive and vomiting. Mm -hmm. And he has the same type of LFD that I showed you for the other glycogen storage disorder. He's got elevated liver enzymes and hypertriglyceridemia. Do you think he's got glycogen storage disorder? Uh, see, you cannot just rule out on the basis of this, but definitely, you know, the failure to thrive is very striking in this case. It's, and the, uh, the history of having recurrent uh, uh, vomitings uh, and all that. So, yes, I would keep GSD potential because of maybe uh, the high triglycerides, but 
uh, I would have. Did you have a history of any aversion to, uh, you know, sugar or any? So why food? why is that? See, uh, it's important because uh, high triglyceride levels they are one of the features of uh, uh, HFI. That is one okay. thing which is there uh, you know, as a differential. So that high triglycerides can occur in glycogen storage disorder. Dr. Yes. Roshni pointed out cholesterol is just storage disorder can occur in other conditions like also HF5. So we have quite uh, a difference. Maybe here. even even acute pancreatitis, you can have high triglyceride levels along with hepatitis as a part of that. But since we are discussing metabolic uh, diseases, so I guess <laughs> uh, we should be looking at okay. that part. Yeah, you'll stick to metabolic. So we did do a further <laughs> workup. We were also worried about the failure to thrive because mm -hmm. that's unusual in glycogen storage disorder to have failure to thrive. And so we did come up with. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah a little about have... acidosis, mm -hmm. which turned out to be a normal anion gap acidosis. But what was interesting was this is an element of proteinuria and glycosuria. So we worked this child up further because we were worried whether this child was having renal issues mm -hmm. and we were surprised that this child actually had rickets which was so, within so the did we do an afp level in this case uh, looking at tyrosinemia mm -hmm. because you would have uh, if there's a kidney involvement with hepatitis uh, you would think of uh, tyrosinemia and you know absolutely rta kind of. absolutely so uh, so we have now someone with uh, vitamin d levels which are normal a normal anion gap acidosis, hypophosphatemic rickets, glycosuria, phosphatemia, as well as uh, proteinuria, all suggestive of a proximal renal tubular acidosis. And you've already spotted the uh, possibility of uh, tyrosinemia in this child as a possibility. Uh, okay. I think the other differential would be Fanconi Bickel or GLUT2 deficiency. Yeah. So nice. liver with uh, proximal RTA would yeah. be tyrosinemia with uh, Fanconi Bickel. Yeah. And and maybe you know HFI also. And HFI, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we did go ahead with a liver biopsy, which did show micronodular cirrhosis, hepatic. Rosetting and a little amount of increased copper. And the pathologists also agree that this is a metabolic liver disease which has already got it for cirrhosis, but this is certainly not glycogen storage disorder. And now at this point of time, we did ask the questions. So we have a child with failure to thrive, liver biopsy suggesting a metabolic disorder, a proximal RTA, and the urine succinal acetone was negative, excluding tyrosinemia. So now we went back to whatever Dr. Vidyut suggested all the while. He did have a history of aversion to anything that is sweet to taste. And this was a history that the mom clearly gave us. We tested him for a reducing substance, oh. which came back as negative. Mm -hmm. We tried doing a fructose challenge test, but there was no hyperglycemia, right. but he vomited all the oral fructose instantly. We did try doing a urine paper chromatography for the sugar, but there was no fructose. There was an amount of glycosuria because of the proximal RTA, but there was no fructose. The other um, investigation, if you're suspecting HFI, is uh, um, transferrin glycoforms. Okay. Um, sometimes can show a type 1 pattern. I mean, uh, yeah, it's not a quick test, but sure. the isoelectric focusing of transferrin can show a type 1 pattern. There was one lab which used to do transfer and isoelectric focusing in Mumbai, yeah. but they've stopped doing it recently. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're so rely on genetic. Said, uh, <laughs> okay. Finally, so a clinical exome, oh, and right. it turned out to be uh, <laughs> hereditary fructose intolerance, full max to Dr. Okay. Dr. Roshni. So, Dr. Roshni, how do you actually treat HFI? Uh, so, HFI. It's, it's not easy. You need a fairly specialist uh, dietitians, but I'm, I'm sure it's online somewhere. So it's a diet restricted in fructose, sucrose and sorbitol. Um, so it's not easy to do for the patient. Unfortunately, it's pretty difficult. There's lots of, well, all fruit 
and there's lots of vegetables that are excluded from their diet so um yeah it's not easy uh, once if once the diet is instituted then the liver did um, improve and the majority of our patients have got normal liver function and um, tests on treatments uh, i haven't seen cirrhosis before so that's un that's unusual to me but Okay, so uh, thank you for that lovely, I think we just have the one last slide which I'm going to run through as a spotter. So this is a 55 day old girl born with neonatal jaundice and I'm going to focus your attention to the hypotonia, dysmorphism, a very wide open air connecting all the way to the posterior fontanelle, single palm crease, overriding toes, bilateral zonular cataract and this is the child. What we did was basically an x-ray knees, which shows a lot of calcific stippling. And this is uh, usually a spotter. This child was diagnosed to have elevated levels of plasma, very long chain fatty acids, and a homozygous hair deletion in the PEX gene, confirming a diagnosis of zell Beger syndrome, a very, very rare form of peroxisomal disorder. In summary, what we tried to tell all of you is that metabolic liver disease in children is of very diverse etiologies and clinical presentations. A history of consanguinity, hepatomegaly, abnormal LFTs, and fatty liver on ultrasonogram, especially in very small kids, gives us a clue to suspect metabolic liver disease. Liver biopsies are diagnostic in some situations, they are prognostic, and sometimes they give us insight into the pattern of liver injury and help us to work towards a set of diagnosis. Next generation sequencing is increasingly playing a role in the diagnosis of inherited monogenic liver disorders, but it needs careful interpretation and correlation with the clinical lab and histopathology, as sometimes we come up with variants of unknown significance and that puts us into a lot of problems. Thank you, my dear panelists, for making this session very engaging and very interesting. And I thank you all for a very patient listening. Thank you, Srini. Thank you, Vish. Thank you very much, thank uh, Dr. Dr. Roshni, for excellent thank cases. You. And uh, thank you, the panelists, Dr. Roshni and uh, Dr. Vidyut, for making it much more interesting. Thank you very much. And um, we'll close the session. Thanks a lot.